help to remind us how to live. Remind us to depend on you. Remind us, God, to bow our knees in prayer, bow our hearts in prayer on you in our time of trouble. Help us to live like that, God. Not live, not live like we can do it on our own, but to live dependent on you. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team, and all you who are on the worship team out here singing, praising God. Those of you who are watching, I think we're going to probably have quite a few that are watching today, not able to be here for one reason or another. Some people, uh, you know, not feeling well, and we try to keep this a safe place by saying, hey, if you're not feeling well, then stay home and watch this, okay, on your computer or however you can watch this because um, you never know what is going on today with the virus and all those kinds of things. So we just ask people to play it safe and um, put, your, put other people uh, in your hearts first, okay? I know we want to be in church. But uh, we want to be mindful of each other. This is the lighting camp, by the way. If you're just watching, you say, what, am I, what in the world have I tuned into? What have, what have I started to watch here? This is the lighting camp. We're a church in Kent, Ohio. My name's Larry Knoll. And we're so glad that you could be with us. And those of you who are here, you know where you're at. You chose to get up and come and be with us. You didn't just find us on your phone or on the computer. But you chose to be with us, and I'm very, very thankful. And, and many of you have chose to be with us who are streaming as well. And we thank you for those who are faithful watchers of the videos. So I uh, want to invite you, though, if you've never been here, this is a great place, some wonderful people who will love you. They will extend love like you would not believe. This is a place where you will feel the presence of God and it's a great place to build relationships and maybe find your next best friend. You just never know. You might just find that person. So welcome, and we are working on a series on breakthrough. And we picked this back up last week. We started it in the summer, and then we took a break from it. And so this is about prayer today. It's called Prayer Breakthrough. Now, Wednesday nights, we have something very special, and we call it TURN, the Upper Room Network, and uh, we got that name from uh, Lou Engel, and Lou Engel is probably spearheaded one of the largest prayer movements in the United States for years. I mean, this man is all about prayer. And he has seen God do amazing things through prayer. And he is constantly calling people to fast and pray. And so I was involved with uh, one of his 21-day fasts back in, 20, um, back in 2020. And uh, it was very interesting. You know, we were fasting and praying for the nation leading up to the election. And also... We were fasting and praying for the Supreme Court that they would um, make a decision on abortion that would be a decision that would save millions of lives of the unborn. And it seemed like nothing had happened. It seemed like nothing had happened. We did all that. We prayed and fasted. And, you know, I mean, the things that we were praying and fasting about, it seemed like it didn't happen. But I want you to know, this year, we're seeing God bring that before the Supreme Court. And so we have to know that sometimes we are planting seeds. We are working on things with God in the future that we have no idea how it's going to go. But we need to be obedient and pray. And I want us to go to a scripture that we all kind of know, James 5.16. James 5.16 as a directive. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other 
and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, we believe in that here. That's why at the end of a service, once we have ended the streaming broadcast, we ask people to come up if they have a need, if they need prayer, and we anoint them with oil. We have elders of the church do that, and they pray for people who have a need. We've seen God do great things. We've seen a man in our church recently who, because you know, the ravages of COVID on his body has had him uh, basically imprisoned in one IC unit to another, to rehab centers, and since December 27th, he wasn't able to be home. He wasn't hardly able to see his family. I wasn't able to get in but once or twice in 10 months to see him. Sometimes we were only allowed to speak to him through a little crack in a screen. We had to stand outside and pray with him and talk with him that way. But I want you to know that God spoke to us when we were praying on a Wednesday night at the Upper Room Network. And while we were praying there, we felt there was this breakthrough as we prayed specifically for this man. And we prayed, and we had been praying for weeks. Now, this was back in May, I think, of this year, May or June. And we had been praying since January, February, March, April, just thinking any time now God's going to raise him up and there's going to be a turn. But it seemed like there were turns and then there was setbacks. But we kept praying, and in, uh, it was sometime in May or early June that on a Wednesday night, we felt something different happen. And I told this man, I went and visited him, and I took Warren, and I don't know if you remember this, Warren, but I said, hey, buddy, your breakthrough is coming. God is getting, God has done this already. So no matter what you see, no matter what you feel, hang in there. Don't give up, because your breakthrough is already done. It's already taken care of. And I really believed that. And we just kept praying in that way, God, make this happen. He suffered long enough. And let me tell you, it was June, July, August, September, October before we saw things begin to change. And he's home. And he's been home three weeks now. Praise God. Amen. And we are continuing to pray for him and uh, believe that God is going to finish the work. He was on a trach. So, you know, those things have to heal up and before you can eat again. And um, I mean, this man was in a coma for like a month. They put him in a coma so that he would, you know, survive. So anyhow... It says right here, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so you may be healed. We believe in that. And then it says, lastly, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I like things that are powerful and effective. When I had sinus headaches years ago, and I would have, con I would have a lot of sinus headaches. I don't know why I don't have many more. I think my brain shrank, and now I have more room for my sinuses to expand. Something like that happened. But I used to have these terrible sinus headaches, and somebody introduced me to a wonderful powder, and it wasn't cocaine, okay? It was BC headache powders. If you've ever had those, they come in little wax envelopes and you open them up and you pour this ingredient which is really nothing more than excedrin it's the same ingredients of excedrin and you pour it on your tongue but i swear they're way better than excedrin they just go they they're powerful it says on there and effective i think they borrowed that from the word of god it is powerful and it has a little shot of caffeine in there by the way they put in there so it makes you feel Good whether you feel good or not, okay? It's like you had about three cups of coffee. It's like, whoa, that's good. It's the original energy drink, so what can I say? <laughs> so the prayer of a righteous person is like that. It's powerful and effective. When you pray, this is saying, it's effective. It doesn't fall on deaf ears. It's not a waste of your time, even though it feels like it some days. doesn't change your gray skies to sunny sometimes doesn't take your depression away sometimes it doesn't give you 
you know, a million dollars in your bank account sometimes. But I'm telling you, it's powerful and effective. And it's powerful in a way that God can do anything. So whatever you ask, the word says, whatever you ask, he's able to do it. And he's willing to do it. Billy Graham de defined prayer like this. He says, prayer is a spiritual communication between man and God. Okay? A two-way, two-way relationship in which man should not only talk to God, but also we should listen to God. Now, sometimes during prayer, we don't get the answer we're looking for at that moment, but God is speaking to us. But because he's not telling us what we want to hear, we quit listening. It's like, no, that's not what I want to hear, God. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, I want to, you know, help me with this. And he's saying, yeah, but I'm actually helping you with this. Go this direction, do this instead. So prayer is not just talking. It's not just telling God what you need or how you feel, but it's communication. It's heart-to-heart -heart communication. James says in that scripture that when we pray, we are communicating with God. We are having heart-to-heart, -heart, sincere communication, not just going, okay, God, here's my grocery list. Here's what I need. I need this in my life, and my kids need this, and my wife needs this, and you know, my job and blah, 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 blah. He wants to hear that, but that's not all there is to prayer. That's not communication. That's complaining. It's not just repeating phrases either. It's not just saying certain things. Um, you know, we teach kids these cute little prayers before they go to bed, before they eat. But at some point, you know, we're hoping that that can, you know, translates into Something greater than that, okay? That's where we might start. We might start, and Jesus even gave us the Lord's Prayer, not as a, something that we have to say word for word, but it's a starting place, okay? And prayer is not just fulfilling a commitment. Well, you should pray, okay? Uh, God, I can carve out 15 minutes, um, you know, in the parking garage when I get to work, if I get there early, I don't know, you know, what's your situation? Sometimes we just feel like I need to fulfill this commitment and get it over with because I'm supposed to pray. It's communication. And my memories of powerful and effective praying actually come out, part of it comes out of my family. I remember my grandmother, Mamie West, and we would spend summers in, at her house, mom would drop us off on her way to work, and we'd have the whole day at Mamie and Roy's, okay? And that wonderful playground of a, like, you know, corn and tomato plants and peppers and pawpaw tree and hills and creeks and man, you talk about, that was better than Disney World. And we'd be over there, but I'm going to tell you, in the afternoon, I would hear this loud roaring going on out of a bedroom, and it wasn't snoring. It was Mamie West praying. And she could pray. And I think that her pr the volume of her prayers is why the wallpaper was sagging in some of those rooms. You remember in the corners of those rooms as the house settled? I don't think it was that. I think she was sucking the wallpaper right off with her prayers. And I remember we would have prayer in our living room when relatives would come over for the holidays. And before they would leave, we had this thing we would do, and, and everybody would pray. And so instead of standing in a circle holding hands, that's fine. But here's what this group would do. They would get on their knees, face in the couch, face in the chairs, face out on the floor, whatever you could find, and it would start. And it was like 10 mamies. And it was just a roar of prayer. And it would just be like, one, two, three, go. Boom. And they would just roar. And they would just, it was powerful and effective praying. And I remember that. And as kids, we thought it was hysterical, you know, because it was just like, these are the same people who were just cutting up. And now we're praying. And, but they believed in prayer. And they wanted to pray with each other. I remember that. And I remember a guy named Cosmo de Bartolo in Youngstown where I was at a church. And I would go in and 
if you are lucky enough to be in the same hospital room when you're doing hospital visitation, he was our worship leader in Cosmo. Bless his heart, this guy, the whole hospital knew about this person's need, and the whole hospital knew all the scripture verses that applied to that need, let me tell you, because he was going to pray it loud and proud, that crazy Pentecostal Italian. Hey, what's the matter for you? And I remember when we first started this church downtown, that little room, that little building, and we had a group from Malone, and they were the Muhop group, okay? Malone University House of Prayer. And they would come down, all these college age. You remember that? And they would come down. And there was a guy from Africa. His name was Stephen Najura. And he prayed differently. He prayed for an hour. And he would, he would stand up here, and I was worried the microphone was going to run out of battery. I mean, this man prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And I mean, we would have waves of prayer as he prayed. And then when he would let go, and then somebody else would come up, and then he'd come back up and do it again. And, and he taught these young people how to pray. These are just some examples, I, memories I have of powerful and effective praying. However you pray, by the way, is okay. You don't have to copy Cosmo. You don't have to pray like the Knowles or the Harrises. Or the Wests. You don't have to pray like some great preacher you've heard. You just pray. Let God direct you and lead you. You know, I pray totally different than any of those people. I just talk like this with God most of the time. So how do we talk to someone, by the way? When we're talking to somebody and we're having a conversation, okay? Our BFF. Not counting texting. Not counting social media. When we are talking important stuff, we talk face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball. That way, we know we've communicated. All right? It's not across the room while you're cutting coupons, okay, when you, that you talk about something important. Yeah, so, you know, I got fired today. <laughs> you know, don't know how we're going to pay the bills. <laughs> No, see, you have important things. You have a conversation like this. So you can see, first of all, did they get it? How do they feel now that they got that information? You're not just delivering information. You're talking. See, that's communication. It's not hurried. It's not distracted. We're not watching television when we have one of those conversations. We're not checking our phone for text messages every time it goes, yeet, yeet. We put it down, and we have an eyeball-to-eyeball conversation. See, God made us with two ears and one mouth. So we should be listening twice as much as we're talking. Is the way. If you do the math on this, if you do the math, he gave us twice as It wouldn't have been funny if he gave us two mouths and one ear. be like one ear here. What did you say? Then you could talk out of both sides of your mouth, right? Hey, hey. <laughs> All right, that's my weird imagination. But prayer is for communication. It's for relationship building. And its purpose, though, not just for that, but as we are building that relationship with God, as we are learning more about Him, as we're learning how to hear His voice, that's important that we know His voice, Something else should be happening is that we trust him with our stuff. The stuff that we can't do, the stuff that others can't do, the impossible things, the things that seem unlikely unless God does it. I've seen people say, I don't know what we're going to do. The bills are this and our bank account is this. I don't know what we're going to do. I think we're going to just have to, you know, whatever. Fold up and suffer the consequences. And I've seen God do incredible things. He has been there and met needs for people in the most unlikely ways. Because he's powerful. He's able to do this. 
And you, you can say, well, it would have happened anyhow. Or it's luck. I just don't see that. I just don't see that, not knowing their circumstances. So prayer is for relationship building and communication, but it's also for accomplishing the impossible. Wednesday night, we were talking about a, a two-year-old boy that we were, have been praying for. We've been praying with people at work about this young boy who had cancer. Listen, it was verified he had cancer because after the doctors in this area looked at him and he had had all the exams, they suggested he go to a cancer institute out of state. When he got there and they were getting ready to do a procedure on him, they ran their own test. They said, you don't have cancer anymore. We don't know if you ever had cancer. I, I'm telling you, enough doctors here knew he had cancer. So God, we believe that the effectual fervent prayer, the, is, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Okay? We believe that. And there is circumstances where we used to call this praying through. Do you remember that? Yeah. You got to pray through on this. So I'm calling it, we have to pray for a breakthrough. I think we understand what that, praying through sometimes is kind of a church term. So when I'm talking to somebody, I like to say, but have you prayed for breakthrough on that? Because we understand what a breakthrough is. And there's three things I want us to look at about prayer in the next few minutes here, that we're going to cover here, okay? Three things. One is spiritual power comes through prayer. Spiritual power. And number two, promises are fulfilled through persistence. Okay, we'll talk about that. And then number three, the road to victory is paved with prayer. So first of all, I want to credit an anonymous source for this outline. I have no idea. Um, I'm not kidding. This is the name of this book. Okay, I got this outline from. It's called You Need a Sermon Outline Book. <laughs> U-N-E-E-D-A. And my, it was my grandmother's. It was in a bunch of stuff my mom gave me from my grandmother. And it's called You Need a, <laughs> you need a Sermon. <laughs> I need a sermon. Trust me. All right. <laughs> But when I saw this, I said, this is really, really good. Now, I changed it a lot, but um, it gave me the idea for this. Number one, spiritual power comes through prayer. If you lack power in your life, spiritual power, and you should have this. This is a dimension. of You're not just a physical being. You are a spiritual being, too. Okay? When you die, your spirit man leaves you. All right, and you are no longer living on this earth, but your spirit is still alive. All right, this is scriptural. Well, we have a spiritual power that's available to us for that spirit man. So the physical does not limit the spiritual. Are you hearing that? The physical world does not limit the spiritual world. But sometimes we don't realize the power that we have. So let's look at Acts 12, verse 1. This is about the early church. And it says, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. And this happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. So if you're good at math, there were 16 soldiers guarding one man. Okay? He had no weapons. And he's in jail. But they had 16 guards. They've been through this before, in other words. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. When I read this, I thought of our brother here that we prayed for and prayed for, who was in this prison of sickness. 
the church was earnestly praying for him. So here's the situation. James was executed with a sword. There's the head of your church right there. He's executed. Then Peter is arrested. He's put into prison surrounded by 16 soldiers. It doesn't look good. What I'm trying to say is this is not the best situation. This is not what we signed up for with this church plant, okay? They needed a breakthrough. It's just simple. It's not going to happen. They are outnumbered. They're overwhelmed. They need a breakthrough. When it doesn't look good, what should we do, everybody? Verse 5 tells us, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. When it doesn't look good, what should you do? Pray. When your friend is in a bad situation, what should you be doing? Praying. Believing. This should be our priority because why? God can do anything. Did you hear me all the way back there? I said God can do anything. Anything. What is it that you're thinking of right now that you need him to do? Well, he can do that. And the New Testament church was really aware of this. They'd seen God do some incredible things, starting with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Okay? Not a bad start to the church. And they were desperate. Right now, they're desperate for God. One of their church leaders, James, has been killed, and now another church leader is in prison. And he's going to go on trial, and most likely he'll be put to death or he'll be sent off somewhere. What are we going to do? And I love this. Verse 5 says the church earnestly prayed for him. And verse 7 says suddenly, I love the word, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. I can imagine. You're down in this dark cell. All right, there's no lights. It's stinky. It's damp, whatever. You're down in there. And all of a sudden, this bright light comes on, and you still don't wake up. I imagine the angel's a little disappointed. He's like, I'm going to give him my best shot. You know, and he's got like 4,000 watts of halogen. And he's like, and he's like, hey, get up. He had to, he had to nudge him, quick, get up. And the chains, when, when he started to get up, the chains just fell off of him. And Peter is delivered. Why? Because of the earnest, sincere powerful prayers of the church and luke is giving an example the power of the state versus the power of the church here you got this roman empire all the power 16 guards that are armed one man no no match Poof. change are gone angel comes in and the verb that's used in this sentence, when they say the earnest, when they say the church prayed earnestly, when you look at that, the verb that's used there, it means there was a continuous, fervent, united prayer going on. Continuous. They didn't give up. They kept praying. They kept asking. See, the church is interceding for Peter. Is this a lost art that we have, maybe? Is this a lost weapon that the church, we've forgotten about? We're running around crazy. What are we going to do in the world that we're living in right now? How's this all going to shake out? When we should just be praying. We should be interceding. Prayer is the only weapon that the church has, and it's more than enough. It's more than enough. And if continuous, fervent, united prayer is not our first action in times of crisis, it tells us something. If that isn't our first thing that we think of, then that tells us something. It tells us that we're dependent on somebody or something other than God. If prayer is not your first thought in a time of crisis, who are you depending on? What are you depending on? I don't care if you could do it yourself. Pray about it first. Maybe God doesn't want you to solve the problem yourself. Maybe he wants to do it or show you a different way to do it. Maybe your way is flawed and it gets you into more trouble than you imagine. Verse 12, 
says this, and when this had dawned on him, so here's Peter. He's in the prison. He's sound asleep, bright lights, gets kicked, get up, chains fall off. The way I see it, he's half awake, and this angel is leading him out of the prison. Okay? He's half awake, and I think Peter probably thought, I'm, I'm dreaming this. There's no way this is happening. I must be dreaming this, you know. But when he gets out on the street, the angel leaves him. Here he is out on the street. He's not that far away from the prison. And it says in verse 12, when this had dawned on him, it's like all of a sudden, wait, I am outside the prison. This is not a dream. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, and also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So they were having a house prayer meeting, all right, at Mary's house, Mary, the mother of John. So the angel leads him out. He's out there. He has this wake-up call. This is not just a dream. This really happened. And he goes to a friend's house, Mary. And the church is praying. They're in there praying for him right then. You know, when the answer comes, we should be found praying. We should be found praying. If we really want this, if we really need this, if this is something that we need God to do, we should not quit praying about it. When the answer comes, the answer should interrupt our praying. And then we'll just transition into praising. We'll go, oh, well, praise God then. And we'll go from praying to praising. Funny thing, though, this girl, Rhoda, okay, she answers the door. I don't know if she was a servant or what, but she answers the door, and she is so shocked that this is Peter that she runs away. <laughs> she just leaves this man who was in prison, and she just leaves him there. She doesn't invite him in, and she goes running off to the group. She's like, it's Peter. And they're like, what? You know? And she's like, Peter. And they're like, Yes, we're praying for Peter. No, I'm ready for Peter. And they're like, we better go find out what she's saying, you know. She breaks up this prayer meeting, and Peter's still standing outside. I just love this picture. And I, but they don't even believe her. They're like, you're out of your mind. Peter is still in prison. You didn't see Peter. It's dark outside. You must have, you know. Have you ever prayed and had a hard time believing that was the answer? I mean, if you're praying about it and you really believe God and somebody says, there's the answer, have you ever gone, no, that, I don't think that's the answer. <laughs> no, that's not my miracle. Well, that's what was happening here. And sometimes we do that. We, we have a hard time believing and receiving the answer. But in verse 16, it says, but Peter kept on knocking. He's like, hello, I'm out here. I'm the... I, the answer to your prayer, here I am. And they were astonished. They were like rubbing their eyes like, wait, what? This is Peter. It's, ooh, definitely smells like the prison. Yes. Why are we so shocked, though, when God answered prayer? I've heard it more than once, and I've said it myself. We say, I can't believe it. Well, then why were you praying? <laughs> See, I know we just say that. But in truth... Isn't that sometimes we're praying, we're asking, and when it happens, it is really unbelievable to us because we still are these physical human beings, and when God does something out of the natural, he does something supernatural, it is astonishing to this human brain. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need the early church had learned to depend on prayer for breakthrough it was the only weapon they had let's look at the second thing here promises are fulfilled through persistence so do we commit to prayer do we commit to prayer 
Or is it just one of the things that we do? We cover the basis as a Christian. I, I probably need to pray about it. Let's pray about it. You know, yeah, oh yeah, we're, yes, let's pray. <laughs> you know, it's like we try out 40, 11 other things, and then somebody says, have you prayed about it? Uh, let's pray about it, you know. Sometimes we start running, we start trying to solve the problem, we start trying to do things in ourselves before we pray. So do we commit to prayer, though? What do we mean by committing to pray? Do we pray and pray and continue to pray, or do we give up when nothing happens on our timeline? When it doesn't happen when or how we think it should happen, do we go, I've prayed, I'm tired, I don't know if I can pray anymore. Why? Why would we do that? And 1 Kings 18 is a great story here. I won't read this whole thing. I won't read this whole thing. But there was this severe drought and there was this famine, all right, because of spiritual decline going on in the kingdom. And King Ahab, for whatever reason, had enlisted these ungodly prophets of Baal. You've heard this story. And so they had tried everything to get nature to give up rain, these prophets. Because they were ungodly, it wasn't going to work. But they were trying all kinds of things, all kinds of prophecies, all kinds of divinations. You know, they were basically satanic, trying different sacrifices, different incantations. They were doing all these things. And here is this king who has turned to the dark side to try to get help. So finally he gives up on this bunch and he calls for the prophet of God, Elijah. Forty, Forty false prophets can't help him, so he calls Elijah up. And Elijah finally shows up. And this is that thing on Mount Carmel. You know this story. Forty false prophets versus one prophet of God. And the whole thing is we're going to have a contest. We're going to prove who is the God. You know, I think, before I say that, I think sometimes God just wants to show people what he's capable of. And things happen. Problems arise. There's famines in our lives. There's things that go wrong that we can't figure out. And God is going to show his power through this. And so what he does, he says, we're going to have a contest, and I'll let you go first. And you 40 fellas, what we're going to do is we're going to build an altar here, and, the fir and we're going to see whose God can consume the sacrifice that you put out there. And you go ahead and have your worship service and make your incantations, and you call on your God all you want. And boy, these 40 guys, they load all, they get the driest wood they can get all this stuff, and they piled around the sacrifice, and they, they put the, you know, what they're sacrificing on, on their altar, and they dance, they sing, they, they read, they scream, they cry. This goes on and on and on and on, and as you know, all 40 guys eventually wear out. I mean, you know, they're hoarse. They're spent. So Elijah says, are you done? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, good luck. He goes, okay, hey, see those water barrels over there? I want you to pour and soak the wood with water. In fact, keep soaking it till it's standing in water. I want water just filling the moat. I want, I, want, I want just, you know, and they're like, you're crazy. We couldn't get dry stuff to light. And you're going to soak it now? So they do that. And what happens is he just prays a little prayer to God because he's close to God. He prays all the time to God. God knows him and he knows God. He's got this relationship. And he prays down fire from heaven and it consumes the water. It consumes the sacrifice. It consumes everything there. Boosh! It's like an atomic bomb going off. Wham! It's gone. And then he goes, oh, yeah, and these 40 guys, you need to get rid of them. Why don't you take them over there and kill them because they're satanic? 
They're from the dark side, and you don't ever want to be tempted with that again. Get it out of here. So then, see, the king had been fasting, preparing for this, I think. doesn't say, but he, would, he had been fasting, getting ready for this big event. Maybe he was just too nervous to eat. I don't know. But Elijah goes, hey, go over there and get you something to eat now, okay? They got snacks for you over there. Go eat. Go eat. Because I hear the abundance of rain. Remember, what were they praying for? They were praying because there was a drought. They were praying to bring rain. And he says, go ahead, king. Relax. Have a good time. Get you a Coke. Put your feet up. I hear a storm. Now, nobody else could hear the storm. Are you listening to this? Are you listening close? He said, go eat and drink. Because it was a day of prayer, he had been fasting. Go eat and drink, for there's the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed back up to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down on the ground, put his face between his knees. In other words, he was praying again. And even though God had promised rain, he had to ask for it. He still asked for it. Even though God promised it, he kept praying for it. He got alone with God and prayed, and God had promised the water of rain by sending fire and consuming the sacrifice. So here's the cool thing. He says, go and look toward the sea. He tells his servant, go and look towards the sea. Now he's up on Mount Carmel. He says, go out there and look towards the sea. And the servant goes, he goes, I don't see anything. He goes, okay. So he keeps praying seven times. He prays, sends a servant. Finally, the last time the servant says, well, I see a, I see like a black rain cloud about the size of a man's hand, about the size of a man's hand. So he's like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. Your family and friends may not see what you see or hear what you hear. God has told you, he's promised you, there will be an abundance of rain in your life. There will be an answer to this. And they don't see it. They don't hear it. But you know, in your knower, God has promised this. Elijah said he heard the abundance of rain. You see, this is what should keep us on our knees. God, you promised it. <laughs> you said you were going to do it. And I believe your word, God. And even though I don't see it yet, even though I don't smell it, even though I can't taste it, even though I don't, there's no evidence anywhere of it, I know you're good for it. And we keep praying and we keep thanking God for his promises. You pray, that's what you call praying until you get your breakthrough. That's praying through if you're from the old days. And seven times, doesn't say how long. It might have been seven hours. It might have been longer than that. I don't know, but he kept sending this servant back. Now here's the cool thing. He saw that cloud coming. And it was a big storm. It was a storm. You know, if you look like that at a cloud, it doesn't look like much far away. You can cover up a big cloud this way. The closer he got, he could see it was really storming. So he goes over to the king. He says, hey, dude, you had better get your stuff and get back to the palace real quick because a big storm's coming. So they get all their stuff together. And the king doesn't even offer him a ride. Isn't this gratitude? So... He takes off in his chariot and all of his entourage. And he's like, hey, I need a ride. So he just starts running. He runs under the power of God so fast that he outruns the chariot back. To, and he's standing there waiting and said, hey, what took you so long? You know, I took the God Express. I mean, it's just an amazing story. I'd like to see a movie made out of this sometime. Maybe they have. And we see there's other instances in Daniel 10. Daniel prayed 21 days before he got his breakthrough. And we look in Genesis chapter 32. Jacob had to wrestle all night with an angel to get what he needed from God. But let me read this to you. It's about George Mueller. You may have heard of him. If you go to georgemuller.org, you'll see this. 
you know, what George Mueller was all about. But in November 1844, this is what he writes. I began to pray for the conversion of five individuals. I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether sick or in health, on land, on sea, whatever the pressure of my engagements might be. Eighteen months elapsed before the first of five were converted. So after a year and a half, one person out of the five comes to know the Lord. I thanked God and prayed on for the others. Five years lapsed. And then the second one was converted. So now he's prayed six and a half years and only two people have gotten saved. I thank God for the second and I prayed on for the other three. Day by day, I continued to pray for them. And six years passed before the third was converted. And I thank God for the three and went on praying for the other two. And these two remained unconverted. And 36 years later, what did I say? 36 years later, he wrote that the other two sons of one of Mueller's friends were still not converted. And he wrote, but I hope in God, I pray on and look for the answer. They are not converted yet, but they will be. Hmm. And in 1897, 52 years after he began to pray daily without interruption for these two men, they were finally converted. 52 years. But it was after he died. He never got to see God answer prayer. Isn't that amazing? And Mueller understood what Luke meant when he introduced a parable that Jesus told about prayer, saying, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Luke 18.1. Wow, can you pray for 52 years for anybody? Could you pray for 52 years? and not even see the answer to prayer, but believe that God was still going to answer that prayer even after you're long gone? How long have you been praying for that loved one? How long have you been praying for that person in your life? And you go, I don't know if it's ever going to happen. Listen, if God's laid them on your heart, that's for a reason. You hear the sound of the abundance of rain. That's why you're praying. It's because you know and you're knower God's going to do this. And lastly, the road to victory is paved with prayer. So you want victory? You want breakthrough? You want something different in your life? You want God to move? You want... I think about Paul and Silas, and we've talked about that over the weeks. Here they are locked down in this prison. I mean, it seems like these guys are always in some prison. And I love this. They're down there praying all night long, having their little turn service. And it, I love the word. It's there again. It was in the other story. It's in this story. Suddenly. You see, you're going to pray, and you're going to pray, and you're going to pray, and it seems like that person's not going to get healed. That person's not going to come to the Lord. And you're looking for some like gradual thing to happen. You're thinking, the more I pray the closer we're going to get to this. I just have not seen God work that way a lot. And when you look at the scriptures, you see these words, suddenly. It's like, you know, you pray for 52 years and suddenly it happens. Now to us, that's a long time. But when God moves, it just happens then. He doesn't need time to make things happen. It's just time now. And there was no cloud. There was no cloud. There was no cloud. And then suddenly there was a cloud the size of a man's hand. Isn't that something? So expect God to answer your prayer suddenly. But keep praying. It may take six months. It may take six years. It may take 60 years. But are you committed to your situation? Are you committed to to praying for that situation. Are you committed? Because that's what it takes. We're going to commit to pray to, for this. You know what we need? We've looked at a building 
haven't we? We've looked at a building twice and it hasn't happened. The same building. How about we commit that to prayer, constant prayer, and see what God will do suddenly? Because we've been laughed at and told, your offer's too low, we won't even think about it. Okay, praise God. Well, why don't we commit to prayer and see what God suddenly does? You need a healing, you need provision, are you praying for somebody in your family? Why don't you commit to prayer and see what happens? I'll tell you what will happen suddenly, at once, God will answer that prayer one day. Yes, that's right. Suddenly, at once, God's going to... I mean, I know in your own family back there. Suddenly, at once, God did a miracle, what, a week or so ago? Suddenly, at once, He did a miracle. What seemed like Satan was about to swallow things up. And suddenly, at once... There was a breakthrough. So I love that. So there's always hope. There's always hope for healing. There's always hope for provision. There's always hope. Even for repentance. There's times where we get sideways, God, and we like Jonah, a servant of God who refused to do things the way God wanted. He was like, God, I'm not doing that. And he goes a different direction. And as we know about Jonah, as a fish swallowed him, a big fish swallowed him. I mean, what an incredible circumstance. But I love this. In chapter 2 of Jonah, it says, from inside the fish, inside the fish, can you imagine? He had a turn meeting inside the fish. <laughs> Not the radio station. I'm talking about the real deal here, okay? The fish, this big fish. He decides maybe it's time to pray. And sometimes our circumstances swallow us up. It's not too late to pray. Pray right there inside that circumstance. And if you need to repent like Jonah and say, God, I missed it. You were right. I missed it. And we turn around and we repent of our decision to disobey God. I love the scripture. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead. Ooh, have you been in the realm of the dead? I called for help and you listened to my cry. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you that we can be in the realm of the dead. We can be swallowed up by our circumstance. We can be in a prison locked up. It could be a physical prison. It could be a spiritual prison. It could be a financial prison. It could be a relationship prison. Whatever it is, God, you are able. God, help us to look to you to be our source, to commit to prayer. And realize that is the way to victory in our own life. Lord, we just commit whatever it is on our heart today. There's, there's many people watching. There's many people here listening in this place. I'll bet there's a circumstance right now for each one that they're worried about, they're concerned about. And whatever that is on your mind, on your heart, whoever it is for, will you commit to praying daily for that? Will you commit to praying daily for that person, for that situation, for that need? Why? Because I want you to see God move in your circumstance. I want you to see God move in that relationship. I want you to see God provide for you. I want you to see how God can give you a breakthrough. But we're going to have to be like the early church. We need to be found praying as God answers that prayer. Will you commit to praying to that today? Will you commit to praying for that day? Maybe it's for you. Maybe it's for somebody else. Doesn't matter. We have enough proof right here in the scripture. We can pray for somebody else and we can pray for ourselves. But God is a powerful God. And that's why that 
was written that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. See, we're righteous not because of our own deeds. We're righteous because of the work of Jesus Christ within us. And if you've received, if you've been redeemed by Jesus Christ, if you've received him as your personal savior, you're righteous in God's eyes. You can come confidently before the throne today. So I want you to commit to praying for that circumstance. We pray on Wednesday nights. You want to come and pray with us here at 6, six o'clock on Wednesdays? We, will, we have a list of people that we pray that rolls on the screen up here. And we pray for them. We pray for these circumstances till they come off the list. And we've seen God do miracles already just recently. Two great miracles that I already shared. God has a miracle for you. Will you commit to praying? Father God, I pray that those who are committing right now and saying, yes, that's what I'm going to do, you, that you will prove that to them. Maybe they've never tested you in this way. Maybe they've never committed in this way before. God, I pray that you will... Uh, answer their prayers, God. You will give them strength to continue praying. And Lord, that they will come to know you in new ways and discover a relationship with you like never before. God, we just cover all these needs right now in the name of Jesus. And we lift these up. We lift them up, God. Thank you, Lord, that you are able. Thank you, God, that you want to do this. And that if need be, you'll send an angel into our circumstance even. Now we give you praise in advance. Lord, that we can hear the abundance of rain already in some of these things. Even though we can't see it, we know, Lord, that you will answer. You will take care of these things in our lives. Because we are committing them to you by faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to, Sandy, if you'll lead us in that song that you're playing. And let's just make this our prayer. If you've made this commitment today, there's a song that says, Hear my cry, O Lord. Let's sing this together. Hear my cry, O Lord. Attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry out to thee, and when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than is higher than I. Let's sing that again. Hear my prayer. Hear my cry, O oh Lord, attend unto my prayer. Yes, Lord. From the ends of the earth will I cry out to heart is overwhelmed and when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock that is higher than I that is higher than I when my heart is overwhelmed oh and when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, that is higher than I. Lord, now we commit, we cry out to you and we commit our need to you, our situation to you, Lord. You are higher. You're 
knowledge is higher. Your power is higher than ours. You have oversight to our situation, God, to our need. And so we trust you for the timing. We trust you for the provision. And know, God, that you are working on our behalf. And now we turn this into praise. We turn this into thanksgiving to you, knowing that you are in control. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Would you give God praise today? Would you give him thanks? Do you trust him enough to give him thanks now? Thank you, Lord. You see, when God answers your prayer, or the prayer that you're praying for somebody else, it's going to be like Elijah. You'll be able to outrun a chariot. <laughs> it's going to fill you with such incredible excitement and enthusiasm for serving him and continuing to love the Lord. So exciting serving God. So we thank we want to say thank you and goodbye to those who have joined us through uh, the internet. And uh, next week's going to be a different type of service. So don't miss that. It's going to be a, an entire service. It's, we're gonna, we're calling it a worship breakthrough. It's going to be all music, reading scripture, different people coming up and praying, and just continual worship. We don't know uh, exactly. Uh, how it's going to be done or who's going to be doing it or what they're going to be saying. It's going to be a service led by the Spirit of God. So don't miss that. It'll be a great time. We'll be doing that live. What we usually do on Wednesday will be live on Sunday. So feel free to come in and we encourage you to be with us next Sunday. God bless you.